Good evening. Welcome to the second installment of the 2023 Simpson Lectures. My name is Matt Walsh, and tonight I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, though Danny has informed me to be brief. Not sure how to take that, but here we go. Thank you for that. Jonathan, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is a pastor, speaker, and activist who, among other things, emphasizes the importance of peacemaking, racial reconciliation, and justice to the Christian life. This morning, Jonathan delivered a thought-provoking sermon on Ezekiel, and it is our prayer as we listen once again that we would be stirred by God's care of those ravaged by unjust systems and even stirred to sing with them. And so now I invite Jonathan forward to speak on the Christian legacy of moral fusion. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. And in keeping with that theme, I wondered if I might uh, start our time together this evening by teaching you a song. Is this already on? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is a song that in many ways... Uh, carries the creed of the tradition that I want to introduce you to, uh, the tradition that despite all of the uh, dark and terrible history we reviewed uh, yesterday and, um, and the ways that it's interwoven with um, uh, the faith that I was raised in, uh, I nevertheless love Jesus because I learned to sing these songs. And I learned um, uh, through people who had passed this down uh, through generations. And so um, uh, I, I love to sing these songs with folks and to share them with others. So, so this is uh, what I take to be the creed of the um, liberative freedom church that was born on the edges of plantations in the South. Um, when people who uh, were called property by folks who claimed to own them were also... Uh, ushered into churches by these people and told that they should, you know, listen to their version of the gospel. Um, they listened closely to the scriptures and to the stories, and they took them with them back to the uh, very substandard housing where they were um, living on the, these plantations. And they would they would get off in the woods, far enough away that the overseers couldn't hear them, and um, and they. They learned, uh, they, they wrote these songs. And um, uh, the, if you come to the South sometime, welcome you all to come. Um, there's a terrible and beautiful history of the South. Um, uh, and uh, you, you, can, you can see both when you're there. Um, if you go to uh, historically black churches in the South, uh, like the Baptist Church where I'm a member, uh, the oldest churches in all of those denominations uh, were founded in 1865 because that was the first time black folks could gather in public. And so the, the stone on the church says 1865. Uh, that's when they became, you know, official public churches. But before they were churches in that way, uh, all of our churches were meeting in the woods in, in what they called the Brush Arbor. And, um, and, and, and in those places, uh, they taught this creed of the faith. It's... Uh, it's fairly simple, but I think it really captures uh, the essence of what they understood about the faith. The first line says, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. I think it's a beautiful statement of faith because it takes belief, it takes faith, and puts it in a very directly relational context, right? I'm not just going to affirm something in my mind. I'm not just going to believe, you know, some idea. No, I'm going to trust this person <laughs> who has meant something to me. Um, so that's the first line. The second says, uh, in a very direct way, that there's no way of trusting and following this Jesus without coming into a confrontation with the world. And so the second line says, I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die. But the radical love ethic at the heart of this tradition is, is right there in the third line because it says we don't fight like other people fight. It says I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right until I die. Now, it will be easier for you to sing this song with your whole body if you stand up. 
So if you, if you don't mind letting uh, the Holy Spirit transform you into an instrument as the Spirit is able, you know, with the, with the resources available, let's do our best. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy who still struggles with rhythm, so I get it. But um, uh, after many years of practice, I can clap on two and four, and uh, all these songs work better if you do. So I'll start singing it. You know the words now, and you can join in as you're able. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die. And I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right until I die. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right until I die. Now, you know these words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So I will trust. In the Lord, I will trust. In the Lord, I will trust. In the Lord until I die. I will trust. In the Lord, I will trust. In the Lord, I will trust. In the Lord until I die. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you for singing and thanks to all the saints who practiced that faith and passed it down so that we can learn from it. Uh, yesterday evening in the first of these lectures, uh, I tried to introduce the real and present danger of white Christian nationalism. Um, for those of you who were here, uh, it was a rather heavy uh, review of the impact that um, some organizations and a whole lot of money have had on uh, churches in the United States. And uh, I tried to convince you uh, also uh, beyond the United States, even uh, these days here in Canada, and in other parts of the world, um, a danger not only to uh, the political life in uh, the places where we live, uh, but also to the spiritual well-being of people in our communities. And um, I promised that if you would come back today, that I would, uh, uh, after trying to show how what is happening is rooted in a very long story of the uh, abuse of religion, in particular, uh, 
uh, within the uh, slaveholder economy uh, in, in a kind of accommodation of Christianity to the practice and the patterns of slaveholding that grew out of the South, um, that even as it, that is a very long tradition, that uh, the good news, it, it has occurred to me, <laughs> the good news is that God has always been showing up in those places and offering an alternative in the midst of it. That's where songs like the one we just sang came from. And so uh, the tradition that I would like to introduce you to today in terms of the way this faith practice and this faith tradition has tried to engage public life is uh, what I want to introduce to you as moral fusion politics. And so I'd like for us to consider together uh, by looking back at some of the same history we talked about yesterday, the power of moral fusion politics that grew out of the faith that was uh, um, lived and practiced on the edges of plantations. The first opportunity for that faith to engage in public life in, uh, in, in a public and open way was Reconstruction in the South. Of course, the faith that had... Um, uh, inspired folks, and that it was passed on through those songs uh, was it was very formative uh, to the abolitionist movement, which was determined to end slavery, and the Underground Railroad, which was the uh, uh, very practical effort to get people out of bondage, uh, even uh, as they continued to work for the political change that would be necessary to end slavery. Well, as it happened in the United States, um, this was not inevitable. Uh, it had worked out differently in England, as you know, and uh, uh, many in the U.S. hoped that it would there too. But uh, slavery did not end in the United States without a very long and bloody war. And so uh, in the midst of that war, as people were trying to figure out what to do and how to respond, um, there's one person in particular who I wanted to introduce as kind of a way into that period and to how faith was practiced in that period, because uh, he's sort of a bridge between this place and the place where uh, I'm from, and that I talked about a good bit yesterday, North Carolina. Uh, his name is the Reverend J.W. Hood. Uh, J.W. Hood was born in Pennsylvania, but as an adult found his way to New York City. And in New York City, he joined uh, what, uh, as a black, as a free black man in the United States, um, and this is before uh, the war, so um, it was significant to, to be a free black person. It meant you had to have papers that said you were free, because by this time there were fugitive uh, slave acts that allowed uh, people uh, to run around all over the United States, including uh, cities in the north, and, uh, and claim people as property to be returned to uh, their so-called owners in the south. And uh, this was a, a regular thing that happened. Um, it was uh, uh, endorsed by federal legislation in the United States. So a free man in the North who made his way to New York City, and in New York City became part of the Zion Church, which is the mother church of the AME Zion tradition. Um, and the Zion Church was a, a vibrant center of this uh, uh, liberating black church tradition, uh, which is often the name that's used. But just as an aside here, I'll have to say, if you study the history of what uh, we often call the black church tradition, uh, it begins first in Philadelphia with Richard Allen and the AME Church, and then in New York at Zion Church with the AME Zion Church. And if you read the original documents of both churches, they do not say they were starting a black church, just for the record. These were people who had not been fully welcomed as full members of the uh, uh, predominantly white Methodist churches that they were part of. And so these Methodist traditions started as churches for all people, um, uh, churches that would be uh, uh, welcoming to everyone uh, as they understood the gospel to welcome everyone as equal members of the body of Christ. Uh, and that is what they were established to be. So I hesitate to call them black churches, although I do know that's the nomenclature we we use uh, to describe these things in our world. At any rate, uh, the, the Zion Church um, uh, was based in New York, uh, concerned about particularly Christian faith among the sort of African diaspora in North America. And so they knew very well that uh, there was a sizable uh, population of people of African descent up here in Halifax. And so when they sent out missionaries, they sent J.W. Hood first as a missionary to Halifax, Nova Scotia. 
and at least in the records that I've been able to find, I don't know a whole lot about what he did in Nova Scotia, but he spent a short time uh, here before he was called uh, by the mission board of that church uh, to go south in the United States because the Civil War had started, and when the Civil War started in the United States, something interesting happened. It first happened at um, a place called uh, Port Comfort in uh, Virginia, and uh, there's, a, there's a bit of river that runs there at that port uh, where the uh, uh, you know, river meets the sea. There's a, there's a place where uh, uh, just across the river, um, the Confederate soldiers in Virginia controlled that land. Uh, but on the other side of the river, there was this fort, a fort that had been there for some time. And there were Union troops stationed at that fort. And one night, uh, three enslaved people who had been brought with the people who claimed to own them to this Confederate encampment. You know, these, these folks were so used to having slave labor, they had to take their slave labor with them even when they were out soldiering in the camp. So they had them there cooking and such or something. They, anyway, three of them um, uh, got to talking to one another and figured that th if this was a war about slavery, you know, they were always listening, trying to understand what was going on. So if this was a war about slavery and the people across the river were fighting against these folks who claimed to own them, that maybe if they could get over there and talk to them, they could make a deal. So they get this little boat and they get across the river and on the other side, they meet the general at this fort and they make their appeal. They say, uh, you know, the, the, the states that are in rebellion against you claim to own us. Uh, you know, we're coming to declare ourselves as uh, you know, refugees of this war. Will you, uh, 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 you know, grant us some kind of status? And the general there issued a field order that became very influential in the Civil War because it said at any place along the lines of the war, if enslaved people could get across the line to the Union side, they were to be considered free people by the Union troops and treated in that way. Uh, it didn't take long for that word to spread. So um, uh, this Fort Comfort happens to be the same place where the first enslaved people arrived uh, in the Virginia colony in 1619. So uh, I went there in... Uh, 2019 uh, for the 400th anniversary with, with my family and we we went to uh, you know the, the the place to see where the ship had come in but then we went inside the fort and they showed us where you know the people started showing up and they set up camp you know inside the fort walls and they and they started you know having a little village there and there's actually still a tree that's still living that was there then and they under this tree they set up the school so that the kids who had you know gotten away with their parents to this fort and were you know, beginning to imagine a life of freedom, the first thing the parents wanted to make sure is that they got an education, and so they had somebody sit under the tree every day and teach the kids how to read and write and, and, and all of this. So this is what was happening there, and the field order held across the lines, and so down in North Carolina, the Union troops also had come from the ocean, and they controlled a city called New Bern. And so New Bern was the place where word got out, if you could get to New Bern, you were free in North Carolina. Well, um, there was a sort of almost mythical character, a man named Abraham Galloway, who um, uh, knew that network of the brush harbors on the plantations of eastern North Carolina very well. I think he had some experience as a preacher. Um, uh, he was also someone who had gotten away. And uh, he had an incredible capacity to sneak onto these plantations at night and to ride into town the next day with hundreds, sometimes thousands of people that he had gathered in a caravan and who flooded out here to, uh, to, to New Bern and uh, eventually to a whole separate town they set up. It, it was a tent city. Um, and uh, if you study the history of the Civil War, it's, um, I think historians are, are, are fairly agreed now that without the Union troops who volunteered from these encampments, so the formerly enslaved Union troops who volunteered to go and fight for the Union army from these encampments, uh, the Union probably would have lost the war. Uh, and so these uh, so-called colored regiments were uh, extremely influential after 1863 in terms of the Union army actually being successful in this war. But what the Zion Church in New York knew was that there was a very large community of recently free people who were trying to form a community down there in Newburn. So they sent J.W. Hood to bring the good news of the AME Zion gospel to Newburn. Uh, 
and he went down and he went into the Methodist church in New Bern that's still there, the Centenary United Methodist Church, and uh, he brought the good news to the black folks up in the balcony. You don't have to sit in the balcony anymore. There's a church called the AME Zion Church where you can sit right on the front row. <laughs> in fact, you can be a minister like me. It didn't take long for him to persuade all the folks who had been connected to Methodist churches anywhere around to become AME Zion, and he became a very influential leader in that community while the war was still going on, such that when the war ended and the 13th Amendment passed, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution said that people could no longer be held in bondage as uh, enslaved as slaves. And, um, and, and then a 14th Amendment was passed that said that, uh, that these newly freed people were guaranteed equal protection under the law. Uh, and that they were, by virtue of their birth in the United States, they were natural-born citizens. This was a big deal, right? Because it was one thing to be free, but that didn't necessarily mean you were going to be a citizen of the country. As a matter of fact, for many people uh, of African descent in the North, they had been free. They had had free papers, but they weren't in any way, you know, allowed to participate in public life. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact... I don't know this history incredibly well. Some of you may know it better than me, but some of the people who ended up in Nova Scotia, uh, in Halifax, some of the black folks up there had fled New York City after the revolution because they were not uh, treated as you know, anywhere near equal citizens. And, um, and frankly, there was also some negotiations with the, with the British and uh, the fact that if you had been a loyalist, you could, you could get out. So at any rate, um, uh, all that to say, uh, Hood... Uh, was 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 a, a leader in this community at the moment when people who had been enslaved were becoming citizens for the first time. And then when the 15th Amendment passed, these at least the men among these newly freed people had the right to vote. And this was incredibly important because readmission to the Union for all of the southern states required them to affirm these so-called Reconstruction Amendments, if they were going to be part of the United States, they had to be part of a United States that recognized formerly enslaved people as citizens with full rights, including the right to vote. And so, across the South, there were what were called Freedmen's Conventions. And in North Carolina, when they called the Freedmen's Convention in Raleigh, which is our state capital, uh, at the uh, AME Church, which was... The, you know, only place black folks had to gather in the state uh, of any size, uh, the, the freed people of North Carolina elected J.W. Hood as their leader. And he would go on, after they held an election, to be the representative in the state house from uh, the, the Newburn area, the place where he was pastoring. And he was instrumental in forming a new coalition of people who would work to remake the state. What's fascinating about this period, and what I think we can learn from it in terms of the kinds of public engagement that are possible by people who have, you know, resisted this religious nationalism that we talked about last night, is that he and the newly uh, uh, empowered uh, folks of African descent who were in North Carolina realized, of course, they were going to join the Republican Party because Abraham Lincoln of course, had been the leader of the Republican Party, and he had signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That pretty much sealed the deal. Any uh, 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 formerly enslaved person who had a, an opportunity to participate in public life was going to join the party that had been anti-slavery. So all the black folks in the South were going to be Republican. But again, there were no Republicans in the South because the South had been controlled uh, uh, up until that time by folks who were doggedly committed to slaveholding. And so, um, uh, um, by themselves, in most places, uh, these new black Republicans did not have the power to, uh, uh, you know, win enough seats that they could pass legislation. And so they did what y'all do in Canada. They did coalition politics. You know how this works, right? If you don't, by yourselves, have enough, you figure out who your closest allies are. And this is really fascinating. What happened in the South during Reconstruction is that the newly empowered... African-Americans recognized that their closest allies were the poor white folks, right? The poor white folks who had never really benefited very much from the plantation system. I mentioned the uh, freedom tree up at Port Comfort earlier where black folks said, if we're going to be free, our kids are going to get education. 
Well, an interesting thing that happened uh, when they started talking to people about a political coalition was a lot of poor white people said, our kids have never had an education, right? Universal public education was just not a thing in the South because the plantation owners so, saw no reason to invest in that. Uh, uh, um, you know, in Massachusetts, universal public education is in the Constitution. John Adams thought it was a big deal. You know, there were parts of the United States where public education was sort of a centerpiece to democracy, but not in the South. No, no the, plant, the plantation owners were happy to pay for private tutors to educate their children, but they didn't want poor white folks or the enslaved people to be very educated because they wanted to be able to, uh, uh, to tell folks how things worked. And so the coalition that forms the fusion parties that were established during Reconstruction in the South were mostly poor white populists. They, they were part of a party called populism, called the Populist Party. Poor white populists joined with these black Republicans and formed these fusion parties that, uh, for a brief period uh, at the beginning of Reconstruction, uh, had the majority in most state houses in the South. So you ask yourself, what did those folks decide was important, right? When they got together and they had the opportunity to, uh, to, to shape policy in public life, what did they do? Well, J.W. Hood, as a matter of fact, was influential in rewriting the state constitution in North Carolina. And um, it, what's, what's fascinating, is particularly as you know, a minister, right, who, who was uh, drawing on a biblical imagination as well as you know, this, the, the, the will of this political coalition, it's fascinating to even look at the language that he inserted into our state constitution. So to this day in North Carolina, if you read the preamble to our constitution, it uh, picks up language that was used in the Declaration of Independence in the United States. You've probably heard this language before. It says, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all persons, it says in the North Carolina Constitution, all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and then he inserts this, the just fruit of one's own labor and the pursuit of happiness. Because if you've been... If your labor has been stolen from you every day of your life and you have an opportunity to participate in public life, then you make it a constitutional guarantee that people have a right to the fruit of their labor, that if you work all day, you ought to be able to have. So we actually have an, a constitutional guarantee of a living wage in North Carolina, although uh, we don't have a living wage in North Carolina. Uh, uh, but there's a constitutional argument to be made that we're in violation of our own commitments in, uh, in our, our failure to pay people a living wage. If you read further down in the North Carolina Constitution, there's, there's, a, there's a part where it says that beneficent provision to the poor is the first duty of any civilized and Christian state. That's in the Constitution. This is pretty incredible influence in terms of faith informing public life, but it, it happened literally because these fusion coalitions where ministers like J.W. Hood were, were, were involved were putting their faith into practice in terms of building a vision for shared life together that addressed historic harms and that uh, uh, tried to write into law uh, the promise of equal treatment and equal opportunity in, in a future society. Uh, it's really an incredible moment in American history and one that um, uh, was largely forgotten for a long time. In the 20th century, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, he was one of the founders of the NAACP, uh, and he, he worked very hard to just recover the memory of this time for a later generation, he wrote a book called Black Reconstruction in which he recounts much of this because, uh, be, because so much work was done in the aftermath of what we talked about last night, that redemption movement that really used mob violence to crush these coalitions. Um, so much was done to, to not just forget, but to replace the memory of, the, of those kinds of partnerships with uh, a very different myth, the kind of myth that was uh, portrayed in that film that we talked about, The Birth of a Nation. I mean, in, in, in many ways, uh, the fiction that that Baptist preacher I was talking about yesterday, Thomas Dixon wrote, um, all of his fiction was a kind of, uh, kind of counter-propaganda to the real truth of what had been possible 
when uh, black and uh, poor and working white folks came together and began to imagine, uh, and imagine in moral terms and in the terms of their faith, a society where everyone could thrive. Now, as we looked at last night, uh, there was violent opposition to this, and there was the use and abuse of, of uh, religion to overturn this uh, kind of coalition politics. But the memory of it never went away, and the practice of it continued by people who, who despite the just overwhelming violence of people who said to them, if you try to do this, we will kill you. Let me be a little more specific. The last fusion coalition in North Carolina was destroyed in 1898. They had in our capital city at the time, which was Wilmington down in the eastern part of the state, they had um, uh, elected a fusion uh, coalition to the city council in the, in the recent election. And in response to this, preachers gathered folks uh, called, who, who they called red shirts, um, as in wave the bloody red shirt of the Civil War, right? Remember what your granddaddies and daddies fought and died for. Uh, uh, they, they put on red shirts, and they went out in a field, and they stirred them up with that language of redemption and the need to take back uh, the government from this corrupt and immoral uh, 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 abuse uh, is what they called it, of these fusion governments. And they marched into that city with a Gatlin gun, the sort of the most sophisticated weaponry of the day, and they went into the uh, African-American community and they burned down the uh, building where the newspaper was published and they killed God only knows how many people and ran everybody else out of town. And literally the people who had just been elected to public office to a person were, were run out of town. This is a complete coup d'etat in 1898 in North Carolina. This is how the Reconstruction Fusion Coalitions were overturned. So I'm, I'm talking about serious violence, uh, serious uh, just outright refusal to uh, accept what a majority of the people had chosen in an election. It makes you realize that, you know, the January 6th we talked about yesterday was not that much of an anomaly. It hadn't happened in a while, but it has a history in the United States and in other places in the world. So all that happened, and yet people continued to remember and continued to believe that this moral fusion politics was possible and that it was at the heart of what Jesus wants us to do in terms of practicing our faith in public. So you all know that what followed the redemption takeover in, in the United States was the so-called Jim Crow era in the South. It was, it was this system of sort of legalized separation of uh, black and white folks. Uh, technically, according to the uh, legal language, it was supposed to be separate but equal, uh, and in no way was it ever equal. There was always... Um, uh, uh, sort of preferential treatment, uh, the best of services, the best of opportunities on the uh, white side of town, the white schools, the white fountains. I mean, uh, um, everything was separated. Uh, and there was no investment in, at least from the people who controlled the coffers, the white folks who controlled the coffers, there was no investment in African-American communities. And yet, in the midst of that, the faith of people like J.W. Hood continued, and people continued to dream of the possibility of what could happen if they could organize, if they could build alliances. They, they realized it's going to have to be outside of the South, so can we build alliances with people in other parts of the country, alliances with people in other parts of the world? They began to build organizations, so organizations like the NAACP began to form. Uh, based in New York, where there was a little bit of freedom and a capacity to have organization in public. Most people who see the NAACP today think, well, that's an organization for black folks. You know, uh, if, you, if you've ever seen it, most of the leadership today is black. When the NAACP started, it was mostly white folks, white people in New York who recognized uh, 
uh, along with their black colleagues, that there was a need for moral fusion, that there was a need to, to recognize that this, um, this sin of white supremacy really does diminish all of us. And so they founded an organization that would, um, that would try to build power to question the norms uh, that had not only been established in the South, but that were influencing the whole country. And uh, one story that I've been fascinated by is that in the 1930s, after there had been a few decades of this organization building, uh, there were some uh, students at Yale Divinity School who invited a few uh, religious educators and a few preachers from fairly prominent uh, black churches in the United States, uh, and a labor leader, a man named A. Philip Randolph, invited them together to have a conference on uh, the future of the church and its public witness in the United States. And the basic question they asked, this is in the early 30s, was how can we operationalize the militant, nonviolent love of Jesus to bring down Jim Crow? They met for a few days and talked about this. Uh, we've got uh, good librarians at Yale. They dug up the notes for me. They kept very careful notes of uh, all the talks that were given and all the conversation that happened after the talks. You know, like our, like our Q&R last night. Somebody sat and wrote down what everybody said. And it was, it, it, there was an incredible consensus that came out of this meeting that among uh, these churches and these educational institutions, these are mostly what we call HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities in the, in the South, and uh, these labor organizations that we're founding, that between churches and labor and educational institutions, that there could be a way of building uh, a strategy and building a base for a mass movement that could transform uh, uh, the promises of Reconstruction into reality, not through violence, but through nonviolence. And they were paying attention at the time to Gandhi. It turned out that um, one person who was part of that network, uh, a man named Howard Thurman, and one of the students who was there, uh, uh, who would go on to be a bishop in the Methodist Church, uh, about a decade later, they end up going to India and meeting with Gandhi. And they continued, they're building organization. They're building a vision and a strategy for how the love of Jesus can be operationalized to transform public life. And they really came to believe that Gandhi's nonviolence, the, what he had been practicing in South Africa and India, was instrumental. And they wanted to talk to him about it. And they weren't just there you know, out of personal interest. They were representing a lot of people. You know, this, is a, this is a big delegation. So, so when they got there, they, they recorded the conversation. And it's fascinating to... to uh, to read this exchange, because they go on for some time. Gandhi was um, confused. It, it really sort of blew Gandhi away. He couldn't understand why these people who were the, who were the uh, 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 descendants of enslaved people were so enthusiastic about the religion of the people who had enslaved them. That just confused Gandhi. He didn't get it. You know, Gandhi had heard the Christians talk about Christianity in India. He had never been much impressed. He said, I like this guy, Jesus. He says some good stuff, but I, I, I don't like these Christians. You know, the, I, he never trusted them. But he thought, this is incredible. These people who were enslaved have heard something from this Jesus. that moves. He just, So he just asked questions. for. Him. Well, finally, they get to where the, the delegation is able to ask Gandhi. They, they say, we think you need to come to the United States because we need nonviolence to come to the United States and help us bring down Jim Crow. And Gandhi's response is fascinating, and it was widely reported and remembered in the black press in the United States. Gandhi said, I don't know if I will ever make it to the United States, but I know nonviolence will come to the United States. And he said to Howard Thurman and to the others who were there, when nonviolence comes to the Negro people in the United States, it will go to the whole world. Because Gandhi understood enough about nonviolence and enough about global politics at the time to realize that if uh, this country that was becoming the global superpower that uh, he could see that it was going to come, if its basic contradiction, its basic refusal to practice democracy at home were challenged publicly and nonviolently by the people who had suffered from that, that that would have the power to take nonviolence to the world. It's an incredible tradition 
of people who continue to believe and practice that and build organization and strategy for that, even when they could not see how it was going to happen anytime soon. One of the students of that network of people, you know, I said there were teachers there, there were professors from these HBCUs. One of their students, a man named James Lawson, had come up through college reading the black press, hearing from these professors about this nonviolence. He was so taken by it that he went with the Methodist church to India as a missionary after he graduated college because uh, he wanted to learn from people who had known Gandhi. And so he was in India in 1955 when he read in the newspaper about what was happening in Montgomery, Alabama with a citywide nonviolent bus boycott. And James Lawson, who is still living, uh, will say to this day, when I saw that in the newspaper, I knew it was time to get back home. <laughs> the, the movement had made it to the America, and I needed to put into practice what I had been learning about nonviolence. In so many ways, what the world saw as a civil rights movement a movement that was very publicly led by religious leaders that used a lot of religious language that met in churches, but that was very adamant about uh, making claims on public life. What, what, what folks saw as a civil rights movement was actually moral fusion politics that people had been building organization and vision for for decades. And uh, I'll never forget one of my teachers, Vincent Harding, who was uh, a teacher and an instrumental part of the movement in those years. Um, uh, he said he remembered that prophecy from Gandhi when he was watching the footage from Tiananmen Square. And he heard in a language he didn't understand, people singing a tune that he knew well, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. He said, I knew that Gandhi was right. What he had said to Howard Thurman, when nonviolence comes to the Negro people in the United States, it will go to the world. This moral fusion politics has never gone away. It has continued to uh, inform uh, uh, the, the, the faith lives of people who, who have worked for what Thurman called beloved community. And up until today, it exists, I think, as a resource an incredibly valuable resource for any church that wants to learn public faith for the common good. And so uh, what I try to say to people like me who were raised in places where we were taught that we were white, often not in any explicit way, but just by the cultural cues and the social norms of the uh, uh, society that we've lived in and the organizations and, and institutions that we've been formed by. In any of those places, when the church is trying to figure out how can we find a new way of being church in this time, my first instinct is always these days to say, let's look back to the rich tradition of moral fusion politics. Let's look back at all of these Christians uh, who have been informed by this movement that rejected the religious nationalism that we talked about last night, but leaned heavily into the possibility that their faith could have real and practical implications in the here and now, and who gave themselves to that in the faith that if they trusted in the Lord, and if they stayed on the battlefield, and if they treated everybody right, that the God who raised Israel out of Egypt and raised Jesus from the dead, has the capacity and the power to make something new possible in the here and now. That's the power of moral fusion politics. So that's what I wanted to introduce this evening, and I'm glad we got to sing it before we uh, 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 reflected on its story for a little bit. And now I'd like to open it up so that we have a little chance to talk about it and to talk about... Um, what you hear in those stories, what you can learn, what we can all learn from it. What I want to talk about tomorrow, uh, if you'll be so kind as to come back, is what a movement, a moral fusion movement looks like in the world today. Uh, um, some of what is happening and some of what we might imagine happening if we lean into this tradition. But for now, let's rest with the tradition, give thanks for it, and let's, uh, let's explore it a little bit. Let's kind of open it up and ask ourselves what it might teach us.
this I'll give to you. Thank you. So we have some time for some Q&R, and if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Dean Emerita. <laughs> this is just a simple question to satisfy my curiosity. I'm curious about the term moral fusion and wondering where that comes from, whether that's your um, something that you have used to define it or whether there are other references? Thank you. Um, I think a proper scholarly citation, at least in this generation, would attribute moral fusion politics to uh, my dear friend and teacher, the Reverend William Barber. Um, uh, he would not in any way claim to have uh, dreamed it up or something, but I think he has uh, used that language to describe the tradition that uh, he was raised in and that um, he and I and the rest of us at the uh, new center at Yale are teaching. Uh, so we taught uh, this past spring a course in uh, moral fusion politics in America and really dug into um, the theological imagination and the biblical exegesis of people like J.W. Hood and his, you know, when, when J.W. Hood read the Bible, how did he read the Bible? You know, when Howard Thurman read the Bible, how did he read the Bible? Um, when Polly Murray read the Bible and preached the Bible, she was a preacher at the end of her life. But I mean, there, there's somebody I didn't even get to mention in that brief overview, but someone who really receives this tradition in the church where she was raised, uh, Raise your hand if you've ever heard the name Polly Murray. One of the most important um, um, organizers and theorists, really, of the 20th, 20th century in the United States, and she's very little known. Um, but um, uh, she, as an activist, was doing nonviolent direct action a decade before Rosa Parks. Uh, she was sitting in and trying to challenge the law. She went to law school because she recognized it was a legal issue. And her teachers at Howard Law School were the people who would make the argument to the Supreme Court in Brown versus Education. But they used the argument she had made in class almost a decade earlier to convince the court uh, to, to decide as it did on Brown, which overturned uh, the legal foundation of the Jim Crow South. It was a decision in the late 19th century called Plessy versus Ferguson that had given that language of separate but equal. And uh, um, uh, there had been many ways to try to challenge that, but Murray was innovative in recognizing that, um, that you had to challenge it uh, on the basis of it not being possible, uh, that it's, it's impossible to have separate but equal uh, treatment of people in, in, in a society. Um, she uh, goes on to be uh, one of the founders, oh, well, after law school, she goes on to write the book that actually uh, was used by the civil rights movement across the South to challenge Jim Crow laws because she put all of the Jim Crow laws in one book. They had never been compiled you know, for the sake of actually having the legal text of what this looks like in the different states, because it had developed, you know, on its own in each place. Uh, she did an incredible sort of scholarly work in that way. Um, and then uh, she goes on to be one of the founders of the women's movement, uh, the National Organization for Women. She's one of the founders of that organization before, uh, in her uh, sixth decade, recognizing that uh, while her faith had driven all of her justice work, she did not feel pastorally equipped to accompany people at the end of her life, at the end of their lives. Uh, she had a dear friend die, and she realized that, uh, that she wanted to be a priest so that she could uh, be a mediator of God's presence to people at the end of their lives. Uh, 
and in the midst of their lives for that matter, but she had had this experience with someone who was dying. And so she goes back and she becomes the first black woman ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> so she's an incredible figure. Um, she's now a saint in the Episcopal Church in the United States. Um, but she's but one of many, many examples of people who were raised up in this tradition. So moral fusion politics as a way of describing it is a way of saying that it's a tradition that makes moral arguments based on scripture, based on uh, the, the, the sort of moral claims of constitutions and other public documents, um, and that it's fusionist in the sense that it recognizes that the only way to overcome the um, fragmentation of American democracy, uh, and I think democracy in other places, but, but this is rooted in the US story, the fragmentation of American democracy by a racial caste system is to intentionally organize people across those lines of division. So f fusion organizing is always about bringing people together across lines of division. So that's moral fusion politics. And um, I'll talk some more tomorrow about what that looks like today. It's uh, in many ways uh, broader because there are a lot more sort of ways that people are divided. But, uh, but certainly black and white together is, is always a part of the story. We have another question here. Thank you for your talk. I, I have some friends. I'm a Christian minister. I'm a Baptist minister in town. Um, I have some friends who do not share my Christian convictions. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak about the prophetic in the secular realm. And I'm thinking in particular the witness that has happened this week in the Southern Baptist Convention where, where women are told that they're not able to be ministers. Uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I was raised in that Southern Baptist Church, and uh, if I hadn't gotten out, I'm not sure I could have kept on with Jesus. So uh, as for their uh, present politics, uh, I think the kindest thing I can say about the present politics of the Southern Baptist Church is that they're deeply influenced by uh, all of the organizations that we talked about last night. Um, Ann Nelson, who I mentioned last night, the journalist who has followed the organizational structure behind the contemporary white Christian nationalist movement in the United States, uh, one of the things she argues in her book, Shadow Network, is that um, the strategy for how this movement took over the Republican Party in the United States was actually based on their experience of taking over the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, she makes a historical argument in that way, and I think she's right. Um, but it's simply to say that the same patterns are repeated. So, um, frankly, I'm not up to speed on their vote, but whatever their vote was, I'm sure it was driven by uh, some sort of culture war wedge issue that they think they can use to consolidate power. That's been the pattern within the church ever since this group took over um, decades ago. Um, but... I think I heard, before you asked about that specific issue, I, I think part of what I heard in your question is um, this question of uh, what does it mean to be engaged in public life as a Christian when uh, you're neighbors with people who aren't Christian? Um, maybe your neighbor is Hindu. Maybe uh, your neighbor is uh, somebody who used to be a Christian, but they're so put off by things that have been done in Christianity's name, they don't want anything to do with that anymore. Uh, we've got a lot of those people around. Uh, or maybe there's somebody who, you know, genuinely, as a person of conscience, uh, is not a religious person. Uh, those folks exist, too. And um, uh, I think the question of Christian public witness in a pluralistic society, right, a society that is made up of people who believe all kinds of things about um, God and, you know, how spirituality or religion should be practiced. Um, how can we share life together and share life together in ways that are mutually beneficial? Um, I think it's incredibly important, particularly given the way that the role that Christianity played in uh, settlement and colonization in all of these lands and in, uh, as I've discussed here, in uh, 
the enslavement and abuse of particular populations, I think it's incredibly important for Christians who want to take repentance seriously for those things to reckon with this question, how can you practice your faith in a way that doesn't claim any sort of special power or privilege for your faith? Uh, which is to say, what can we advocate for in public life that would be good for anyone, whether they are like me or not? Now, if you're a Christian, that's going to be informed by your notion of what's good, by your notion of uh, 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 you know, what uh, helps people, uh, by your notion of you know, who matters and who should be prioritized in society. All of those things are always impacted by people's faith and the way they see the world and all those things. So, so I, I don't believe in secularity in the sense that there's, I mean, I, 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 think, uh, I think we are in a post-secular age in the sense that uh, I think we have to recognize publicly that there is no way to sort of get religion out of things, right? We can't sort of leave that stuff at home and then come together and agree on some other terms because whatever you can come to that you agree to is the thing that you fundamentally believe. So, that, you know, so, so if we acknowledge that there are different ways of understanding the world and different traditions that people come from and that we're trying to share life in this place, then I think we have to do our best to learn how to articulate from within our traditions what we think would be good for everyone and then listen to other people and see whether they agree or not, right? I think that is uh, a part of the sort of public dialogue that, um, that Christians should have out of love. Um, we are informed by our tradition as to what we think love looks like, and um, I think we should uh, 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 live into that as best as we can and be open to those moments when people say, I'm not feeling loved by the way you understand love. Let me tell you how, that, how I'm experiencing that. Uh, I think we have to take that seriously as well. Um, but that is the work of politics. I mean, that is the work of, sort of negotiating life together with other people. And um, those of you who are pastors know that, um, actually, you don't even have to be a pastor to know this. Those of you who've spent any time in any Christian community know that simply sharing the Christian faith is not enough to say that you would agree on any of those things that I just went over. So you have to negotiate this in any community, right? Uh, our faith can be a common language that we use, and sometimes uh, learning the languages of other faiths, uh, well, it has often helped me to see things that I didn't see about communities. Um, so I have hope in the possibility of a multi-ethnic democracy in a pluralistic society. Um, I think it takes a lot of work, and uh, I think as a Christian, it's good for us to be for it. Uh, because at least in the world as we know it, I think it's the best possibility of having a, a society that is just in the way that the scriptures talk about justice. Um, the other alternatives seem to uh, leave a lot more people uh, struggling to survive. That's my read. Thanks for asking. Another question here. So a little bit of a follow-on to what you were just saying. Could you unpack a little bit on how to love people in a way that they feel loved when sometimes what would make them feel loved and what is in their best interest diverge? Yeah. That happens. Um, You know, one of the things I've reflected a good bit on, and I think you have to take this seriously in terms of history, um, the worst evils that I've paid close attention to, the worst evils that I've talked to you about in the last couple of days, when you take seriously the people who, who executed them, right, the people who, who sort of fastidiously made sure that uh, 
people who were enslaved stayed in bondage, that people who uh, had political power would be scared to death into not showing up at the polls the next time. And if they did, the people who actually organized for violent mobs to go and lynch those people rather than allow them to vote, when you listen to them, when you listen to their justifications, they all say they did it for their good. Not for their own good, they did it for the good of the people they were trying to control. And, um, you know, at our little red couch conversation today, I talked a little bit about the sort of human proclivity to self-deception. Um, I think religious people have to recognize that we are particularly susceptible to that in terms of our religion because it's what matters most to us. So if you are a religious person, which I take it most of you are, you know, we're talking about religious things. Uh, as an aside, uh, you know, God made everybody. Some people are not as, per, as sort of given to religion as other people. I don't know all the reasons why. But uh, sometimes I like to hang out with the people God made who aren't so religious. You just sort of get a different feel around them. They, they face other challenges. But I've spent a lot of time with religious people. And what I can say about religious people is that religious people seem to be particularly susceptible to self-deception with regard to our faith and to believing that what we are doing in the name of good is going to help other people even when those people tell us it's not helping them. Now, of course, there are you know, situations in which an individual may be particularly misguided. I've raised children. You know, I understand. You, know, you, you can tell somebody this is not good for you and they just don't, they just don't buy it. It may well be, it has been, I think, through history that there are whole groups of people who, um, who, who can really believe that something would be good for them, and it's not. But uh, given the history that we've covered, and I think this proclivity, I'm, uh, I want to err on the side of listening to people. I guess that's what I would say. I want to err on the side of listening to people because I don't think that we have a sort of surefire set of answers that can be imposed upon people apart from uh, the, their actual experience of what it means to them. Uh, so that's where I land. Um, you know. Question yes. back here. Um, Canadian Baptists have had missionaries in India since the early 1800s. Uh -huh. And we went in 1960 and spent 11 years there. And the caste system was um, mm. technically illegal, mm. Mm. but very much practiced. Mm -hmm. And anybody that had a child had to sign their birth certificate of whether they were Muslim, Christian, um, Sikh, whatever they were. Right. And our children were all three Christians. Mm -hmm. And um, when people wanted to get scholarships or be able to advance their education, if they had signed that they were a Christian, they were not eligible. Mm. And I think that that kind of thing is very significant. Yeah. And we spent 11 years there, and it was a wonderful time in many ways. Yeah. But that was a thing that was very hard to cope with. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was thinking about that in terms of when you talked about India, because it made for a different sort of life. Yeah. And we as missionaries were very welcomed, mm. particularly because my husband was so good in Telugu language. Mm. And, um, and he would, after we'd been there five years, he could preach to 30,000 people for an hour in Telugu. <laughs> and so the, what's technically in the law mm. isn't always practiced. That's what I wanted to say. No, that's a very good point. And Part of what you raise, too, is the very different experience than the experience most of us have had in North America of Christian faith being a basis for discrimination. Right? But there are places in the world today and places throughout history where that has been a reality. And um, I think we should, um, especially you know, uh, where those situations exist, reflect on what uh, our 
you know, Christian siblings have learned in those contexts. I mean, um, uh, it can be easy to forget, but it, um, it is possible to be Christian and to believe that Christianity is good news even when it is of no social advantage to you. <laughs> Um, um, that's actually how the movement got started, <laughs> right? It didn't, um, it didn't help you get a job downtown to be a Christian when Jesus was running around, or shortly after, uh, uh, when, you know, the disciples were first spreading the news. But there was something about this story and something about uh, the way that it gave people access to the power of the creator of the universe, that even when it could get you killed, people said, that's what I want to give my life to. Um, that's an incredibly important thing to remember because uh, it may well be that uh, we find ourselves in such a situation again. It may well be that if we haven't discovered why this is good news apart from its social advantage, then we haven't really realized what it is, what the, what the heart of the faith is. Um, yeah. We have a question here. Oh. Uh, I guess I, I want to echo what some people were sort of saying intuitively. Um, when I was pastoring First Baptist Church of Sudbury, I often asked myself, what are the convictions that are for me and my community uh, as in the church, and what are for sort of the wider community? What are the convictions I bring mm. to uh, advocate for everybody else? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a story that kind of illustrates this in the Canadian context. Um, so I would go into the church and I would sit there and work on the computer, uh, which was behind one of those um, cloth curtains, and in the next room, the ladies would gather for tea. And they got into some interesting deep discussions, uh, what they're, you know, favorite episode of House of Cards was that they never admitted to me that they watched and things like that. But anyway, um, one lady remarked about how her boy Justin did some silly things and she was kind of a little anno annoyed at him, Justin Trudeau. Another lady turned and said, your boy Justin? <laughs> how, if, how dare you even think about hmm. you know, any kind of affinity with the Liberal Party? Um, he's not pro-life. <laughs> And the, uh, the other lady turned and said, well, when I first came to Canada from Antigua, um, certain people said, we're, we're just coming to steal their jobs. Hmm. And Trudeau Sr. stuck up for us. Hmm. And so I treat the Trudeaus like family because hmm. he treated me like family. Hmm. Awkward pause. <laughs> hmm. Another lady turned, or the, this lady turned to the other person and said, can you believe this lady? And the other lady turned and said, well, I can't believe either of you. Um, my parents were a part of the uh, union uh, battles with Tommy Douglas. Mm. And I, I clearly think the Bible points to a form of socialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's another awkward pause, and then somebody said, well, how about that tea? And, you know, <laughs> continued on with the conversation. <laughs> well, there within my congregation, I, I saw three yeah. um, frameworks for taking Christian convictions into the public sphere. Yeah. Uh, all in one church, <laughs> mm -hmm. one pro-life ethic of some kind, another a multiculturalist human rights ethic, another one a kind of social gospel or socialist ethic. Yeah. Which one's right? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well put. Um, Rather than asking which one's right, the question I've learned to ask is, who's telling us what the choices are, right? Because um, uh, the particular movement that I described uh, in yesterday's lecture actually created the definition of um, what people understand when they hear pro-life today. Um, it was a, a way of understanding um, uh, so-called Christian values that was cultivated in order to um, uh, manipulate people toward a particular end. Um, and so uh, 
I have, of course, within the conversations about how you live out Christian faith, uh, I have things I'd argue for from Scripture and other things in terms of what priorities are. Um, and those things land in terms of, uh, you know, public issues. Uh, but I don't want to claim that there's a, uh, that there's necessarily one Christian way that they land, right? If you read the Bible, God cares about poor people. But I acknowledge that people have genuine differences of opinion about how you can best serve the poor. I'm open to having that conversation. What I want to challenge is the way in which faith has been used to absolutely silence that conversation and to say, if you're not pro-life, you're not Christian anymore. Um, and that's precisely what that narrative was used to do uh, in the United States. And as I was suggesting, it has spilled over quite a bit into conversations all around the world. So um, uh, I guess what I want to say is I, I, I'm not arguing that there's one uh, definable Christian social ethic for all time and that it has a particular you know, ideological or political expression. Um, but I am saying that I think the long tradition of the prophets teach us that there are particular practices of how faith gets used in public life that we have to challenge because those practices are consistently used to hurt the same people. Um, so, you know, I'd... I would enjoy uh, joining the tea with the ladies at your congregation and talking about, you know, what are the particular texts and the particular convictions of Scripture that they're trying to live out, um, uh, and and uh, have a conversation about how they see that uh, actually helping people they know. Um, and again, people don't always come to the same conclusion. If you're committed to a multi-ethnic democracy, then uh, what you've decided is that the best we can have, at least at a society level, is um, a commitment to uh, let every voice be heard and uh, um, submit to the majority, at least until the next election. <laughs> yeah. Another question here. Yeah. My name is Melvin. I'm pastors in Toronto, but I live in many countries. The things that, uh, should I say, Touch my heart just was what you say mentioned, social advantage. Mm -hmm. I think maybe good at right situation for America or North America, but coming from Asia, I cannot imagine what is social advantage of being a Christian. Mm -hmm. If your mm -hmm. church don't been burned down, right. you have to thank God. Right. You know, you wouldn't believe back in uh, two zero zero, after two zero zero one, I actually do two security planning for two churches huh. because we have a threat of being bombed. Yeah. during those period of time. So I cannot imagine yeah. how does it look like, but I always believe that we should do good to people. Mm. But my question is this, how we as a church are to see common good in eschatological manner? Like it or not, in my situation, I think it fits very much into the revelation yeah. where we are continue to suffer yeah. for Christ until the day come and we will be on the throne to judge, judge people as innocent blood shed. Yeah. Uh, that is what I see. Yeah. Um, I was trying to, to wrap up what you're saying and talking about these things to see how can we prepare ourselves to see common good in an eschatological manner. Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question, and I appreciate you sharing your experience. I, I think it connects deeply with the tradition we talked about tonight in terms of that commitment to treat everybody right. I think that's a core gospel commitment. And it's, it's one that people who have not had the social advantage can see, right? I know the world is not as it should be, and I don't have the power to change it. Those are the people Jesus came preaching to, right? And people who heard that message heard this. The, uh, Howard Thurman wrote about this in a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And what he works out from the perspective of, you know, the, the grandson of a woman who had been enslaved. He's thinking very much in the American context, but I think there's some crossover to any place where he, he says, Jesus came to preach good news to people who live with their backs against the wall, right? People who don't get to decide how things are going to go. But, but Thurman said, if you pay attention to the Gospels, Jesus teaches people a way to live, 
that has the hope of a better world and that might even transform the world as you live it, but that doesn't have to claim power and control over other people. Uh, that song that we sing says that in the most basic terms, I'm going to treat everybody right. Uh, but I, I, I hear in what you're saying, you know, this, this commitment to a love that is even willing to suffer and to believe that God will take care of those who are true to the way of love, right? Who are true to the way of faithfulness, who are true to the way of righteousness, even if it doesn't look like it in this world. Because my, I mean, in the history of the church, we've seen a lot of that. If, 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 if this faith is real, well, St. Paul said it like this, right? If this faith is only good for this life, then we are to be pitied more than all people. But his conviction, of course, is that the truth of this way carries on into eternal realms that we, you know, don't know a lot about, you know, other than the promises and descriptions that we've been given, but, you know, n none of us have been there. But we, that's where our hope is, right? Our hope is in the eternal ends that this way leads towards, whether we see it in front of us, whether we see it in our lifetime or not. And, um, you know, thank, thank you for raising that. I think it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly important part of the faith piece <laughs> of faith, right? <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Thank you. Uh, extremely interesting talk. Uh, my question is around the United States. In a global environment of an increasing uh, split between authoritarianism and a kind of a liberal democracy yeah. and the what appears to be an increasing polarization in the US how long will the United States remain united and what is the life expectancy of democracy you talk about thank you well it's an open question uh, and I think it has everything to do with um, choices people make that's why um, why I spend a lot of time talking to Christians about this. Uh, and I frankly don't think it's just in the United States. I mean, I think um, uh, many of the things that we assume about how uh, society functions are, um, are uh, human constructs that can be deconstructed. And there are people who are determined to deconstruct them. Um, that I can assure you of. And so um, uh, there's a um, writer in the United States who grew up in the church and in uh, many ways was influenced by the tradition that I described to you tonight, although um, he never himself felt entirely comfortable within it. He was a sort of restless figure. And an, one of our very best writers, his name was James Baldwin. And... Um, Baldwin says uh, uh, it's at one point something that on a practical level I think is, is true. He says, um, we made the world we're living in um, and we have to make it over again. Uh, of course, none of us individually made the world we're living in, not even all of us collectively, but we over generations have arranged things the way they are arranged. And um, uh, I think it's important to realize that there's a constant ongoing conversation about how things are going to be done. And it's a, um, that's politics, right? That's a negotiation of power. Um, as to your question of the specifics of that in the United States, uh, I think it's fair to say that there are tens of millions of people in the United States that have already seceded from the Union. Uh, not in a uh, legal way, but in their own understanding of what's going on. Um, and have taken very concrete steps 
in that direction. Uh, most Canadians I talk to are aware that uh, across the border in the United States, we have more guns than we have people. And uh, many people who do not understand themselves to be part of uh, the common democratic project anymore have armed themselves and are sort of ready to do battle with anyone who sort of challenges or disagrees with them on their own personal property. So in some ways, uh, you know, there is already a state of incredible disunion. But uh, I am not in the United States or elsewhere willing to give up on the possibility that uh, people can live peaceably together because I, I think working towards that possibility is the best way I can love my neighbors and uh, have hope for my own children. So um, is it possible that uh, America could have a third reconstruction and uh, become the multi-ethnic democracy that it's never yet been? I think it's possible. Uh, is it guaranteed? No, <laughs> not by any means. But uh, I'm going to invest my energy in that possibility, because I think it's the best way to live out what Jesus says when Jesus says, love your, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's the best way, literally, to love myself and love my neighbor, is to have um, a society that, uh, that, that is more just and uh, more able to produce equitable results for most people than the one that we have now. Um, yeah. So thank you. And I understand that... Um, on this particular evening in this place, uh, we have some music coming, yes? So let me cede this floor to those who are preparing us for the music to come with thanks and hope that I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>